We come now to Genesis chapter 8, the chapter in which Noah and his family leave the ark. So let's get right into it by taking a look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, where we read, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a great wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. I don't know if you caught that phrase that begins chapter 8, but that phrase that begins the chapter is simply this, God remembered Noah. And this is what we call, sort of a big word warning here, an anthropomorphism. An anthropomorphism is a non-literal picture of God expressing his actions or his attitudes or his character in human terms. And the reason why I bring that up is because when it says that God remembered Noah, it implies, and some people might even say it argues strongly for, that God forgot Noah. And we know from other passages of Scripture and just simply from the perfections of God that God doesn't forget anything. Well, if God doesn't forget anything, then in what sense can it be said that God remembered Noah? And again, here we have a figure of speech, a manner of speaking that we have many times in the Bible, the use of an anthropomorphism. Again, that's expressing something about God's actions, something about God's character in human terms. Even though it may not be literally true, it relates it to the best way that we can understand it. You see, God never forgot Noah. He sustained him every day on the ark. But at this point, God once again turned his active attention towards Noah and said, okay, Noah, now we're going to go on to the next step. And it was as if he remembered Noah again. And what did God do when he remembered Noah again in this figurative sense? Well, verse 1 tells us that he made a wind to pass over the earth. That was to help the waters to subside. If you think about it just from an engineering standpoint, what a huge job it was to do something with the floodwaters that covered the earth. I don't know if you've ever had it, that you've had a room or a home or a building that's flooded with water. It's quite a problem. What do you do with the water? Where do you send it? How do you get it out? But this was no problem for God. The God who created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1-1, he could also do this. So, verse 2 tells us that what happened when the flood waters began to recede. We read here, beginning now at verse 2. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Arat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So as the waters began to steadily recede, both from God cutting off the supply of the waters from the fountains of the deep below and the rain coming down from the heavens, God stopped the supply of water, so to speak. Then God, using his own engineering brilliance and the great wind that was upon the earth, began to make the waters to recede to the point that now as the waters were stopped, the ark came to rest, and it wasn't long until they could see the tops of the mountains among them. Matter of fact, this says that it happened, verse 4, on the mountains of Ararat. Now, in one way of thinking, Mount Ararat was not a good place to leave the ark. If you left the ark at a high altitude and very mountainous terrain, it meant that it would be a difficult departure for Noah, his family, and all the animals in the ark. But if God had a purpose to put the ark in a place where it could be preserved for thousands of years, then God chose an excellent place for it. 
And I think if we've discussed this before, there's a lot of interest in people looking for uh, remnants or evidence of the ark in these very mountains. I believe there's some interesting and perhaps even encouraging things that people have found. But if God has a purpose for revealing the presence of the ark and the reality of his judgment in the days of Noah, then up on Mount Ararat was an excellent place for God to let it be seen. As the waters receded, verse 5 tells us that the tops of the mountains were seen. And again, this is another indication in the biblical record that this was a worldwide flood. It was so significant that for a time, the tops of the mountains were covered. And now they are seen again as the waters decreased continually. Now, beginning in verse 6, So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her, and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days, and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him any more. So again, verse 6 describes a period of 40 days. This was counted from the time when the rain and the other water sources began back in Genesis chapter 7. So he says, Noah, I want you to go into the ark. I'm not going to tell you how long you're going to be in there. You just trust me. I'll show you. Noah had to inquire. Noah had to find out. Noah had to investigate as the right time was for him to leave the ark. And in that testing process, verse 6 tells us that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Back in chapter 6, verse 16, it describes this window that was to be made in the upper portion of the ark. That window was made with some kind of covering that could be closed and opened. And so he just said simply, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. God, you told me to build such an ark. I'm going to build it, and I'm going to build it with the window that you told me to do it. I'm, I'm going to go out and see now, using that window, sending out a bird or a series of birds to see if the waters have receded adequately for us to leave the ark. Verse 7 says that he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro. Apparently, the raven did not return to the ark. Ravens are scavengers. And this bird might rest and feed on maybe dead or floating carcasses on the water, but the raven never came back. But if you take a look at verse 9, it tells us that the dove found no resting place. She returned to the ark. Now, a dove is not a scavenger as a raven is. It's a clean, non-scavenging bird. So the dove did not land on the earth until there was a dry, suitable place to land. And when the dove returned into the ark, no one knew that the waters had not yet drained enough to leave the ark or for him and his family to leave the ark. Charles Spurgeon, in preaching on this passage, made a spiritual point from this idea expressed in verse 9, that the dove found no resting place. Spurgeon explained that like the dove, the believer finds no true resting place in this world. Let me read you a quote from Spurgeon's sermon on this. He says this, quote, The world is said to be progressing, advancing, improving, but we cannot discover it. The same sin, the same filthiness, the same universally abounding unbelief that our fathers complained of, we are obliged to complain of still. 
And we are weary with the world, weary with the 19th century and all its boasted civilization. There is nothing upon which the sole of our foot can rest. <laughs> now, friends, if Charles Spurgeon said that of the 19th century, how much more might we say it today of the 21st century? There's nothing upon which the weary sole of our foot can rest. No, our true home, our true resting place as believers is in heaven. Well, in any regard, he sends the dove out. It comes back. There's no resting place for it. Then he sends out another dove, verse 11. The dove came to him with a freshly plucked olive leaf in her mouth. The raven never returned, but the dove came back with evidence that the terrible season of judgment through the flood was over, and God had begun to renew plant life on the earth. And ever since this time of Genesis chapter 8, a dove with an olive leaf in its mouth has been a symbol of peace and goodness. Again, if I can read Spurgeon to you again, he says, quoting on this, perhaps you've seen a picture of the dove carrying an olive branch in its mouth, which in the first place, a dove could not pluck out of the tree. And in the second place, a dove could not carry an olive branch, even if she could pluck it off. It was an olive leaf, that's all. Why cannot people keep to the words of Scripture. If the Bible mentions a leaf, they make it a branch. And if the Bible says it a branch, they make it a leaf. It is very interesting, though, to simply see in verse 11 that it doesn't say that an olive branch was in the mouth of a dove, but an olive leaf was in the mouth of the dove. So, Every time you see that picture, that depiction of good, of peace, a dove with an olive branch, I just want you to think, Bible doesn't say branch. All it says is leaf, and we'll stick with the leaf instead of the branch. Now, verse 12 tells us that the dove, which did not return to him again anymore, that the permanent departure of the dove proved that the earth was habitable once again. So we might expect, starting at verse 13, Noah and his family are going to leave the ark. We read here, starting at verse 13. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And indeed, the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons, wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out. And his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Verse 13 says that this happened in the 601st year. Now, back in Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 through 13, it says that Noah entered the ark on the 17th day of the second month of the 600th year of his life. So now, by verse 13 of Genesis chapter 8, we are almost a full year later. And the second month of his 601st year, that's when Noah left the ark. It seems that he and his family were in the ark for about a full year calendar year. But this was not only Noah's release from the ark, but verse 17 says, bring out with you every living thing. Just as the ark was loaded with animals before the flood, now it was unloaded. There's no mention of animals dying in the year that was spent on the ark. Now again, uh, the animals left 
as far as we know, none died. Look, I, I, I know there's jokes, cartoons and such, such as uh, a unicorn dying on the Ark. And that's why there's not unicorns. And people just say these things in jest. And of course, well, it's a funny thing to think about. But I'm just telling you, scripturally speaking, there's no evidence to believe that uh, any particular animal died in the year spent on the Ark. But God let them out. Verse 17 says, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply. Living things from the ark began to repopulate the earth once again. So now they're free. They're no longer cooped up on the ark, but they've been rescued. They've been delivered from God's judgment, and now they are freed buried with the waters that judge the earth, sustained through all of it, now completely set free. And in that freedom, God made a covenant with Noah. Take a look with me now at verse 20 of Genesis chapter 8. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. We see here that verse 20 tells us that Noah built an altar. You might say that this was his first act, or at least the first act mentioned after leaving the ark. To build an altar to worship God through sacrifice. His gratitude to God, his admiration of God's greatness, led him to worship the Lord and to worship him through sacrifice. And so what did he do? Verse 20 says that he took of every clean animal and every clean bird. Now, if you'll remember, there were two of every unclean animal brought onto the ark, but there were seven of every clean animal. So there were more than just the pair, but not many more. And this reflects something of the nature of true sacrifice. Friends, if you've only got seven sheep in all the world, to offer one of them to the Lord is a great sacrifice indeed. But that's the nature of true sacrifice. A costly offering unto God. With only seven of every clean animal on the ark, Noah risked extinction by sacrificing some of these animals. But I'll tell you this, costly sacrifice is pleasing to God. You might say that common sense would have told Noah, don't do it, don't make that sacrifice. But obedience to God and gratitude to God said, I will sacrifice even if it's costly. Now today, right now, you and me, believers in the world today, are called to offer to God sacrifices that cost something. Our bodies are presented to God as a living sacrifice, according to Romans chapter 12. Resources are given to God as a sacrifice, according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. And the giving of praise as a sacrifice unto God is a biblical concept, according to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Friends, costly sacrifice pleases God. Well, why? Well, it's not because God's greedy and he wants to get as much from us as he can. No, it's because God himself sacrificed at great cost. God wants costly sacrifice from his people because it shows that his people are then being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, who was the greatest display of a costly sacrifice. And Christians should be like Jesus in this regard. Let me read to you Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, where it says simply this, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Friends, 
the greatest, the costliest, the most precious sacrifice that was ever made in all of history was not the one of seven animals that Noah sacrificed when he got off the ark. It was the laying down of the life of the Son of God on the cross at Calvary where he accomplished our redemption. Now, because Jesus has offered the greatest sacrifice, because God the Father gave the greatest thing he could, he gave his own son, then believers should think like David. David in the Old Testament, who said that he would never offer to God something that cost him nothing. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. Now, continuing on, verse 21, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma that was in response to the sacrifice Noah made. The Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Friends, to put it simply, Noah's costly sacrifice pleased God. Verse 21 tells us, the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. It was as if God smelled the aroma of the meat being sacrificed, roasting meat, if you will, and he made this wonderful promise to Noah and to mankind. Now, earlier in the chapter, verse 1, when we spoke of God remembering Noah, we spoke of this use of the idea of the anthropomorphism. Well, here's another one. The Lord smelled a soothing aroma. It's using a human analogy to a divine action or a divine attribute. Friends, God was more pleased by the heart of Noah in the sacrifice than he was pleased by the actual smell of the offering. But when we read this in verse 20, the Lord smelled a soothing aroma, we all understand instantly what it means. God was pleased by the sacrifice. And God said in response, verse 21, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. God promised to never again visit the earth with judgment by a flood, at least on this scale. God would never again destroy every living thing. God did this. Even understanding, as it says there in verse 21, that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. God said, I know the wickedness of man's heart. I know that from his youngest years, there's evil within man. The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. God said, I understand that fully, yet I'm going to make this promise that I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. I will never again destroy everything with a flood on the earth. Now, friends, I have to say, I find this to be a very strange wonderfully strange, but a strange, nevertheless, combination of truths. First, as verse 21 says, God says, I know the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Okay, God knows. God knows the wickedness in our hearts. But secondly, God promised, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. I would say these Two things are a strange combination. God says, I know how wicked you are, but I promise to never again curse the ground for your sake. Man's evil would seem to invite God's curse. Instead, God says, I'll put away my curse. This strange combination, at least in one sense, was accounted for by Noah's altar and sacrifice. God took pleasure in the sacrifice. Verse 21 says that the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And that sacrifice, you could say, was a turning point. 
You see, because there was adequate sacrifice made for sin, God says, I will turn away the curse. Even though I know the sinfulness and the wickedness of man. Now, friends, if this was true, and it was true, of course, in Genesis chapter 8, regarding humanity and the covenant that God makes with humanity, and this in light of this altar and sacrifice that Noah performed, how much more is the greater sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf? God knows our sin. God knows our sinful nature. And yet he says, in light of the sacrifice of my son, I will bring blessing to you instead of cursing. Now, after the flood, we can say that Noah's story illustrates many things that are relevant to the life of the believer. First, you could say that Noah showed the believers freedom. He left the ark. No longer bound to stay in the ark. He's a free man. You can leave the ark. Secondly, Noah showed the believers faith. He made a costly sacrifice, believing that God would multiply the animals that had survived with him on the ark. Third, Noah showed the believers heart in and through the sacrifice. Let me show you my heart. I will sacrifice unto you, God. And then fourthly, Noah showed the believers covenant of mercy. God says, even though I know the evil among you, yet I will put away the curse. I will not fulfill it. And as part of this great fulfilled promise, verse 22, God says that cold and heat, winter and summer, you could say the seasons as we know them, would continue. God promised that after the flood, the earth would have established seasons. And this speaks of the profound uh, changes in climate, changes in the ecology of the earth, since the covering of the water vapors around the earth was emptied. Now, there would be seasonal and temperature variations much more extreme than existed before the flood. God says, no, I'm going to make these things as an enduring testimony to my mercy, to my grace, to my forbearance. I'm not going to bring a flood and there will be a regular cycle of seasons. Now, one result in the radical change of climate and the radical change of ecology in the earth after the flood, one great evidence of this change is found in the rapidly decreasing lifespans of humanity on earth. Prior to the flood, we have some men mentioned to be as old as 900 years old. Friends, there's no more 900-year-old men after the flood. And the mass extinction of animals revealed in the fossil record, such as dinosaurs and other creatures, probably took place shortly after the flood, when the climate was changed so dramatically, and probably in a relatively short time, plunged into something of an ice age. There were animals that were just not suited for the new climate of Earth. They were much more suited for the climate and the environment of a pre-flood Earth. And this is how faithfully God keeps his promises. Friends, you can look at it. You can look at it with great confidence. You can look at the, 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 the seasons as they change. Uh, right now, we're sort of in the middle of spring right here where I live. Even though where I live, we don't have a very dramatic spring, but we have something of a spring. And that'll come into summer, and then autumn, and then winter. The changing of the seasons is a demonstration, in fact, of the great faithfulness of God. Now, we're at the end of the chapter, but let me make just a couple of points here at the end of our look at Genesis chapter 8. Two points on how Genesis chapter 8 points to Jesus Christ. Just two ideas. Maybe we could come up with more if we took the time to do it, but I'll just give you two ways that I think the Genesis chapter 8 points to Jesus Christ. Number one, the covering of the earth with waters reminds us 
of how the glory of Jesus' kingdom will cover the earth. There's a wonderful passage in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. Let me read it to you. Listen carefully here. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, of course, there's a sense, of course, right now in which the waters cover the sea. If you go out and look at the ocean, there's water everywhere. But at the height of the flood waters covered everything. And by analogy, there's certainly a sense in which Jesus reigns right now over the earth. But there will come a day when the reign of Jesus is demonstrably, evidently over everything. And now, there's a big difference between this. The waters over the earth eventually subsided, but the glorious reign of Jesus Christ will never, ever subside. And so I would just simply say this, that the covering of the earth with waters reminds us of how the glory of Jesus' kingdom will cover the earth. That's number one. Here's number two. The costly sacrifice of Noah was pleasing to God. It was a soothing aroma, verse 21 says. Now, the most pleasing sacrifice to God ever made was what Jesus Christ did at the cross. God was pleased to make the sacrifice, and God received it with complete pleasure, knowing that it fulfilled everything necessary for the demonstration of God's love to the world and for the salvation of his people. It was truly a soothing aroma, completely pleasing and satisfying God in heaven. Well, friends, that's it for our look at Genesis chapter 8. Of course, next time we're going to walk our way through Genesis chapter 9. But let's just pause and thank the Lord for his perfect pleasure in the perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on behalf of his people. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we think of how this sacrifice that Noah made when he came out of the ark was so pleasing to you. It was a sweet-smelling aroma before you. Well, Lord, in like fashion, we understand that that was just almost only a shadow of the perfection of how the sacrifice of Jesus Christ pleased you, our great God and Father. And so we thank you, Lord, that Jesus could offer a greater sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice, one that perfectly pleases our God and Father. And so we rest in that, Lord. We completely put away any idea of trying to justify ourselves and making ourselves righteous. Instead, we trust in that perfect sacrifice that the perfect Son of God offered. We do that with great joy, with great peace, and we thank you for it all, Lord. Praying in Jesus' name, amen.